Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Good. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Heidi Correnca Nacion. I am a current health graduate fellow with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And I am originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico, but I uh, did my bachelor's degree and my master's degree and actually spent the last 18 years of my life in Bloomington, Indiana. Go Hoosiers. Uh, and I focus, I got my master's in public health focusing on behavioral, social, and community health. So first of all, I would like to welcome you all to the 2015 Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Public Policy Conference. I would like to thank our health summit sponsors, AstraZeneca, no Novo Nordic, Anthem, Walgreens, Merck, and Jensen Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. You will hear from some of them during the panel, and I would like to introduce two of our sponsors right now, AstraZeneca and Novo Nordic for our sponsor's remarks. First is Ms. Kristen Rogers, is the Head of Corporate Affairs for U.S. Diabetes at AstraZeneca. Please welcome Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Heidi. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today and have an opportunity to support this very important panel of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. AstraZeneca has been a very proud sponsor of CHCI for many years and we commend the CHCI for their continued great work. AstraZeneca is a global innovation-driven biopharmaceutical business that focuses on discovery, development, and commercialization of prescription medicines. We operate in over 100 countries, and our innovative medicines are used by millions of patients worldwide. At AstraZeneca, we strive to deliver value through innovation, solutions through collaboration, and success through excellence. We're a company comprised of many voices views and talents, and we're united by a common mission, improving lives. We believe healthy communities means healthy people, and we know that a healthier world cannot come from medicines alone. That is why we support the efforts of organizations working to improve health in communities across the United States. AstraZeneca has been a supporter of many initiatives of patient, professional, and civic organizations, many of which include the Hispanic community focusing on a variety of therapeutic areas, including oncology, respiratory, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Yet we know there's, more, there's still more to be done as prevalence and health disparities of these diseases remain high. AstraZeneca is pushing the boundaries of science to create life-changing medicines for people with diabetes. As a core strategic area for the company, AstraZeneca continues to enhance its diverse diabetes portfolio to help impact the unmet medical needs across a wide spectrum of diabetes patients at different stages of the disease. In type 2 diabetes, achieving diabetes treatment goals remains a challenge for many people. Early intensive treatment may result in sustained A1C goal attainment. Evidence from real world data showed that early, an early approach to management can help patients reach and sustain their glycemic goals. There's more we can do together to support people living with diabetes. We offer resources for patients, including fit to me there's more information on your chairs. We're also committed to supporting patient access to our treatments through our AZ and Me Patient Assistance Program, which has been helping patients afford their medication. In 2014, AZ and Me prescription savings programs provided more than $670 million in savings to nearly 338,000 people in the United States. We look forward to this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers and AstraZeneca. Next, we will hear from Brian Brenton, Director of Federal Government Affairs for Novo Nordisk. Please welcome Mr. Brenton. Hi, I'm Brian Brenton. As she said, I'm the Director of Federal Government Affairs for Novo Nordisk. Uh, Novo Nordisk is a, a global uh, health company that is focused in the area of diabetes. We also have leading positions in the area of hemostasis management, hormone replacement, growth hormone, and um, we're just now in the area of obesity. Uh, we started our company over, well, nearly 100 years ago by a man who simply was looking to find a cure for his wife who had developed late onset diabetes. And from this love story came our mission, which we call the Novo Nordisk Way. It's in everything we do. Not only do we look at the business impact, but we look at the social impact and the environmental impact 
This is one of the main reasons that we are such uh, proud supporters of this conference here today, and particularly this panel, which is looking at health disparities, because as many of you know, um, minorities are disproportionately impacted in their health care. Just in diabetes alone, um, Hispanic individuals are 17% are uh, likely to get diabetes compared to 10% uh, for non-Hispanic individuals. Um, considering the numbers of people with diabetes in the United States are large, it's 29 million people in the United States right now, 86 million who have pre-diabetes, these numbers are vast. Uh, and right now the federal government is spending more and more of its dollars uh, to treat diabetes. It's $245 million. Well, actually, it's just increased to $322 million. That just shows how much it's just shot up. Um, so we are committed to working on this, not only in the prevention, treatment, and management of disease, but ultimately looking for a cure. Luckily, diabetes is one of the most preventable diseases out there, and there are great programs that have been proven to be efficacious that we um, support. So we hope that some of that gets talked about a little bit today. But we look forward to hearing from the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Branton and Nova District. Now it is my honor to introduce the chair of this health summit, Congressman Raul Ruiz. Congressman Ruiz grew up in the community of Coachella, California, where both of his parents were farm workers. He achieved his lifelong dream of becoming a physician through public education. After graduating from Coachella Valley High School, Congressman Ruiz graduated magna cum laude from UCLA. He went on to Har Harvard University, where he earned his medical degree as well as a Master's of Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government and a Master's of Public Health from the School of Public Health, becoming the first Latino to earn three graduate degrees from Harvard University. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and a fellowship in international emergency medicine at Birmingham and Women's Hospital. He currently represents California's 36th district, which includes the entire Coachella Valley, as well as the cities of Banning, Beaumont, Blythe, Hemet, and San Jacinto. Congressman Ruiz serves on the House Committee on Natural Resources and the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. I would like to thank Congressman Ruiz for his continuous support of CHCI and its mission of developing the next generation of Latino leaders. So without further ado, Congressman Ruiz. Thank you, thank you, Aide, for that wonderful introduction. I'm Dr. Raul Ruiz. I represent the Eastern Riverside County in the Coachella Valley. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. I want to thank uh, Ms. Rogers and Mr. Breton for your support of CHCI and uh, for the incredible work that both of your institutions do to help relieve uh, the health disparities within the, the Latino community. I'm honored to join you today to moderate this panel on the critical topic of health disparities within the Latino communities. The statistics are staggering, and you know them. Latina women are 20% more likely to die from breast cancer than non-Latina women. The average age of strokes in, his, in Hispanics is 67, compared to 80 years old for non-Hispanic whites. Latinos are three times more likely than their white counterparts to be infected with HIV. Latino children have the highest childhood obesity rate in the country with about two to five children aged two to 19 overweight or obese. This is unacceptable and identifying the problem is the first step. But now it's time to work together to identify and implement solutions. As a Latino emergency physician who comes from an underserved community myself, this is an issue that's very, very personally important to me. From the time I was four years old, I knew I wanted to be a doctor to help the community. I'll tell you the story how that decision came about. My mother was the go-to person in the trailer park where we used to live. Uh, everybody would ask her where to find the right medicine, the doctors, et cetera, and she's an angel. Till this day, she would get, give the shirt off her back to help others. 
And so I admired that from my mother. So when she asked me, mijo, ¿qué quieres hacer cuando creces? What do you want to do when you grow up? I would look at her and I'd say, well, mom, what do you call people who help others like you? And she was smart. She said, a doctor, mijo, <laughs> a doctor. So she put it in my head since I was four years old and I wanted to be a doctor since then. And from that moment, I knew that I wanted to serve for that, for that reason, to help people. And as I worked through Coachella Valley High School and, and the time came to move away to UCLA, uh, money was tight and with the help of the, of the community who helped me, I was able to go to UCLA and, and uh, went to Harvard Medical School and what you know, the, the person who introduced me earlier, Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard School of Public Health. And, and um, during that time, I always went home and I worked at farm worker clinics. Uh, as a phlebotomist to see if I really wanted to be a doctor, and the answer was absolutely yes. Uh, and so my life has been one of always fighting for health and social justice and relieving disparities and always connected to that home base of Coachella, of the Coachella, Eastern Coachella Valley, where I saw a lot of disparities growing up, a lot of suffering because of people who couldn't afford healthcare or because there was a lack of physicians or clinics in the area. In fact, uh, when I came back home after 17 years of training and education, you know, students don't get scared. It goes by fast, uh, trust me. So it's okay, you can be a doctor. It takes a long time, but you'll love it. Um, the first place I started doing my work were in farm worker trailer parks, community advocacy work. I'm an emergency medicine doctor uh, at Eisenhower Medical Center, but I would go to farm worker trailer parks, do free health education, free care, started health care initiatives, started a pre-med mentorship program. Uh, there are a group of, to give you a sense of the community, there's a group of dentists and doctors from the Bay Area that go to El Salvador in Guatemala uh, or Nicaragua. Uh, and their only stop in the U.S. is there in our backyards in, in Coachella, Mecca, Thermo area, where up to 4,000 people line up for their one shot to see a dentist or a doctor in a year. You know, 50% of farm workers have never seen a dentist in their lives. 80% haven't seen a physician in over um, four years. So these disparities are real. They're not just numbers. They're not just ideas. They're not just theories. They're real, and real people are suffering because they can't get health care. I've seen the patients in the emergency department where you know young Latinas come in with a breast mask because they didn't have money uh, or doctors to be able to take care of the growth on time before it spread. And, and so these are effects that really devastate our, our uh, patients and our communities. And now as a member of Congress, my perspective as a physician is the most important thing that I believe I bring to the public service. I say this always first and foremost, I'm a physician. And that's the lens in which I see policy and problem solve in which I care for my patients and which I care for the constituents and the people that I serve. Uh, and Americans are wrestling with the fundamental questions of health and wellness with opportunities and choice, with the unavoidable reality that our health is inextricably connected to the education we pursue, the homes we make, and the jobs we hold. And these are the social determinants of health. These are the disparities that we see in education, economic development, and opportunities that are linked to the disparities that we see in health outcomes and healthcare access. I did research with the Coachella Valley Healthcare Initiative in my hometown where we found there was one doctor per 9,000 residents. So we have a physician shortage crisis in our country and it's pronounced critically in underserved rural areas, especially in Latino communities. Not only do we have a physician shortage, but we have a physician shortage of Latino physicians within the physician community that we need to remedy. Uh, Latinos from uh, their underserved communities who go and train in those underserved communities are most more likely to stay in underserved communities. That's why I created a program called the Future Physician Leaders. It's made up of 200 high school and college students who want to be doctors, 80% Latino, 70% uh, women that, uh, that want to serve in underserved communities. And the UCR School of Medicine is really working on 
on creating those residencies in, in those underserved areas. So um, I'm working on legislation to help students get scholarships in the front end so they can go to medical school and th with the commitment that they'll serve in underserved communities. If they don't, then it becomes a low interest rate loans. And so many more things that as a physician, somebody who has had hands-on experience in the community, I'm able to translate into uh, policy that will work. And that's, I'm hoping that the students here, the interns and the fellows in CHCI can realize that your own experience can be translated into smart policy that will be effective on the ground. So I encourage you to, to keep a journal, to remember your experiences because that's one of the most valuable things that you can, you can um, take uh, to, to your line of work. But we need your voices and your ideas. We need the continued involvement of physicians and other healthcare providers and public health experts and other community organization to turn the tide and make a difference. Today, our panelists are going to tell you about best practices they have identified, as well as potential policy solutions. Dr. Eliseo Perez Stable is director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institute of Health. He oversees the Institute's $207 million budget to conduct and support research, training, research capacity, and infrastructure development public health education and information dissemination programs to improve minority health and reduce health disparities. The National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities is the leading organization at NIH for planning, reviewing, coordinating, and evaluating minority health and health disparities research activities conducted by NIH institutes and centers. Dr. Perez Stables expertise spans a broad range of health disparities disciplines. His research interests have centered on improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved population, advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among healthcare professionals, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research workforce. Recognized as a leader in Latino healthcare and disparities research, Dr. Perez Stable has spent more than 30 years leading research on smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in Latino populations in the United States and Latin America. To his left is a good friend of mine, also from Coachella, uh, graduated Coachella Valley High School. Alejandro Espinosa, a public health expert, uh, is the director of projects programs and analytics for the Desert Healthcare District and a faculty member at California State University Fullerton where he teaches community health education. He previously served as a program director of chronic diseases and special project at Latino Health Access in Santa Ana, California. His tenure at Latino Health Access provided him the opportunity to work alongside community-based <coughs> organizations throughout the country assisting in the design and implementation of programs and services utilizing the community health worker model, the promotora model. Mr. Espinosa has also collaborated with academic institutions, public and private organizations and community-based organizations in their efforts to conduct focus groups, pilot research programs and community forums within the Latino community. He serves in multiple committees and sits on various governing boards providing his expertise and knowledge of community-based participatory research and the utilization of community health worker model within underserved communities. Uh, of a personal note, we have squalor, very underserved, dilapidated, suboptimal housing uh, in trailer parks in the middle of the desert with no potable water, no sewage systems, um, with two families living in a small trailer uh, in the eastern Coachella Valley, and it can get hot at up to 120 degrees. And Alejandro has hands-on experience being there door-to-door -door doing community health projects uh, in one of the most underserved, harder reach locations in our country. And so he's here to talk about his personal experience being in the front lines as well. Dr. David Ramirez is the senior medical officer and vice president of clinical services for Care More Health Plan. 
Dr. Ramirez is a physician with experience both as a hospitalist and primary care physician. He was in private practice in Austin, Texas, and subsequently spent several years teaching medical residents while on the clinical faculty with the University of Texas. He has administrative experience working with physicians in a number of leadership roles, including as a hospitalist director, ambulatory care director, and associate hospital CMO. At CareMore, David is responsible for the case management, disease management, clinical operations, and quality management departments. He has oversight of all employed case managers, nurse practitioners, and medical assistants, as well as quality reporting and clinical compliance, quality improvement activities, and new initiatives and pilots. He practiced at the Seton Family of Hospitals in Austin for 10 years before joining CareMore in 2012, and he is a graduate of Harvard Medical School. We were classmates. Uh, we were there at the same time, uh, and, and he actually graduated in the year uh, 2000. Uh, Roberto Valencia is Corporate Operations Vice President for Walgreens, uh, the nationwide drugstore chain headquartered in Deerfield, uh, Illinois. He is responsible for leading Walgreens <coughs> Pharmacy and Retail Operations for over 2,500 locations, representing 60,000 plus team members in the Western United States. Mr. Valencia joined Walgreens in 1978 as a service clerk. During his tenure, he has held various leadership positions, ascending from store manager to district manager in San Antonio and Chicago. In 2004, he was promoted to vice president of store operations. He held that position until 2008 when he was named divisional vice president for merchandising and marketing initiatives. In that role, he functioned as the most senior executive point of contact between community operations, merchandising, technology, real estate, and supply chains for the purpose of developing and enhancing operational relationships. Mr. Valencia was named to his current position in 2013. As corporate operations vice president, he is responsible for the overall development and growth of all drugstores, clinics, healthcare points of care, personnel, and other established objectives within the western region of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. What I'm most fascinated about what Walgreens is doing behind the idea of corporate responsibility, which is very much in line with our idea of social responsibility, is that they take on the personal responsibility as a corporation to serve and underserved communities. In fact, the Flying Doctors event that I told you about earlier, where you have 4,000 of the most indigent people in uh, the Southern California uh, line up to see their only chance of, of seeing a dentist and a physician. Walgreens has been there for the past several years um, uh, inoculating the farm workers with free flu vaccines. And I've had the pleasure of being there and helping administrate some of these flu vaccines for, for our residents. And as you know, the influenza virus uh, hits underserved poor communities, especially with poor housing conditions like trailer parks, the worst. So the H1N1 flu hit our communities hard. It was very devastating. So I'm, I'm glad that I see now more and more companies practice corporate responsibilities and, uh, and making a difference. So having said all of that, we are now going to begin with opening remarks from each of our panelists. Following opening remarks, I will kick off the Q&A discussion and with a couple of questions and then open the floor for questions from the audience. So um, uh, now, Dr. Liceo Perez-Table, thank you for being here. It's your time to give your opening remarks. Thank you, Representative Ruiz, and, and thank you to the uh, uh, Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for having uh, this panel and inviting me. So I'll just be brief. Um, first of all, as a uh, director of a National um, uh, Institutes of Health Institute, uh, I can say categorically that we are committed to addressing issues of minority health and health disparities. Perhaps the, the best example of that is that this institute exists. Um, it started as an office uh, under um, the uh, Health uh, and Human Services Secretary Sullivan um, and this was and then advanced to a center 
uh, during the uh, latter part of the Clinton administration. Um, and as a result of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, um, it, it was actually made an institute. Now, at the National Institutes of Health, uh, these are categories that matter. Um, an institute has granting authority, has a, a slightly higher budget, or the budget may not be the direct uh, issue. Um, but we have a seat at the table with Dr. Collins and the other 26 uh, institute and center directors to address these issues. That is my role. I'm new on the job. I started uh, a little over a month ago, um, and I moved here from California, where um, I was at University of California, San Francisco for 37 years. I'm also a general internist and a primary care physician, which I have put on the side uh, in doing this job. Um, but our mission is to address these two uh, related but not mutually ex uh, overlapping or exclusive areas of minority health and health disparities. Um, and in minority health, we are focused on what is the health of the U.S. population by the racial ethnic categories that we currently use uh, from the U.S. Census. And that, of course, includes Latinos. Uh, which technically are a mixed group, not a particularly separate race. We're also very interested in focus on socioeconomic status as a second important pillar of what leads to advancement in science in these areas. And we have included um, rural poor as, an, as a population target as well. Um, the science of discovery is what NIH is about. And our role in this sort of not focused on one organ system or one disease or a set of diseases is to look at what causes, what leads to these different health disparities or what mechanisms lead to differences or advantages or disadvantages among different minority groups. Um, and identifying these ideologic mechanisms uh, is the sort of the underpinning of what we uh, w will work at. And I will, my charge will also be to figure out how to collaborate and leverage the other institutes, which have much bigger mandates and much bigger budgets, uh, so that we can address this across the entire NIH. And these will include issues around the social determinants and individual behavior. After all, uh, example of excess obesity, for example, is related not just to what an individual does, but also what kind of food access one has uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, what can they afford, um, as for example? Healthcare access is a major issue. How, does, how do our populations interact with the healthcare system? Uh, Representative Ruiz, Dr. Ruiz mentioned the increased mortality from breast cancer among Latina women who are diagnosed. And there are data that indicate that this is related to lack of access to primary care physicians and lack of uh, routine mammography for the women who've already been diagnosed with early breast cancer and presumably cured and should be cured, but they have a higher risk of recurrence. They die more often because they're not getting detected earlier. And finally, the whole category of biology and genetics. Um, there's a fascinating uh, set of stories to be said about Latinos that could be figured out from the genetics of the admixture, and uh, this is one component to further evaluate in our understanding of health disparities. We will then also look at issues of developing and implementing and evaluating interventions that work. Uh, we're not about massive studies, but we need to find the right ones that have been them. Let me finish by just saying that the Latino population, lots has been discussed. Maybe it'll come out in our conversations. We are a very heterogeneous group. Uh, we are a mixture uh, of immigration over 500 years. There's European mixture, there's African mixture brought in from Africa, and the indigenous people of the Americas. Uh, this is actually a great opportunity to learn about uh, mechanisms uh, in this population. It is one of the unique populations in the globe that have experienced this over this period of time. Uh, and I believe that understanding what leads to outcomes uh, in our population will have lessons for all people uh, in the U.S. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Alejandro. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Congressman Reese, for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Congressional Hispanic uh, Caucus Institute for the invitation as well. Um, we at the Desert Healthcare District are very proud to serve the residents of the Coachella Valley uh, since 1947. Our, through a grants program, we have provided resources and support to local community-based organizations 
which target low income and underserved communities, uh, community residents utilizing the community health wor worker model or better known as the promotora model. Um, the community health worker model is based on the recruitment, empowerment, and employment of local community leaders um, who, who face the same health disparities as the people they serve. This sharing of the same cultural traditions and language allows these community health, worker model, uh, health workers to reach and connect with community uh, residents that traditional outreach or marketing methods do not reach. Uh, two perfect examples of this are uh, our partnership with the California Endowment uh, to, for the enrollment um, under the Affordable Care Act where we uh, subcontracted with four local organizations that utilized the, the community health worker model, the promotora model, and they went into the same trailer parks that uh, Congressman Ruiz was talking about to enroll um, you know, uh, uh, community residents that qualified for the Affordable Care Act. But they also went beyond that, not only enrolling them, but also providing educational resources so they knew exactly what benefits and how to actually make a, make a doctor's appointment. As we know, our community is, um, you know, has very low literacy levels and for us to ask them to go onto a website and enroll and to seek services was a very daunting task for many of them. So providing them with, connecting them with, with um, community health workers that had expertise in this area has increased the likelihood of them, you know, not only securing these services, but also utilizing the services. Mm -hmm. Another great example um, is working with El Sol, a local, uh, El Sol a Neighborhood Educational um, Center, which is a nonprofit based out of the Riverside and San Bernardino counties there in California. And they also use the Promotora model for chronic disease um, prevention services, where they host educational classes for our community members in Spanish and any other language um, that, they're, that, they're community, that the community actually speaks. So this increases the likelihood of them understanding the, you know, their disease a little bit better. They're able to have a much more enriching dialogue with their medical care providers and ask these difficult questions that sometimes our community members they just sit in the, in the, in the, in the, in the clinic and, and uh, I guess my colleagues here would attest to that, that they just kind of nod and say, yes, doctor, yes, doctor, yes, doctor, without really having this dialogue and communication with their medical care provider. Um, lastly, we feel that empowering community residents um, to be agents of change while including them in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of programs and services provides us with an immediate knowledge into the struggles and barriers our communities face, thus allowing, um, allowing us to allocate resources and support to address these issues in a culturally appropriate and sensitive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Um, Dr. Ramirez? Thank you for this opportunity. I just wanted to build upon a, a few of your statements earlier. Uh, first, the statistics were really, really eye-opening, and I think they're really a, a call to action, and that's what this uh, session is about. Um, second, although I'm a healthcare plan, insurance plan executive, I'm also a physician, and really my focus every day and what I do is about taking care of patients and being a physician. And third, I knew I wanted to be a physician since I was three years old. <laughs> I, I went. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but uh, all jokes aside, uh, Latinos are, we know, disproportionately affected by chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, end-stage renal disease. And Caremore's model, the way that Caremore was designed, is really to address these chronic diseases. Caremore started as a medical group uh, by physicians, and the focus of Caremore has always been on caring for patients, engaging patients, removing barriers, and matching care desired with care received. And so I want to take a moment just to explain what Caremore is, because Caremore's a health insurance plan, and it has contracted providers, facilities, specialists, but it's also more than that. So in order to take care of patients the best way possible, the founders of CareMore and the leaders of CareMore uh, knew that more was needed. So they built uh, what we call care centers in the communities and staffed these with all the resources that patients need in order to remove barriers and address their chronic diseases. So we have chronic disease programs for diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, end stage renal disease and they're staffed by nurse practitioners and physicians. And the care centers are located in the heart of the communities. So the communities like East Los Angeles or other communities in Los Angeles, Arizona that have um, a large number of Hispanic members, they're staffed by, uh, they have a staff that reflects that membership. So most of the medical assistants are bilingual, a lot of the physicians are bilingual, so they're able to understand and engage the patients. And, it, and like I said, that's in the community. 
So not only is the care there, the access to care, but Caremore also engages with community groups, uh, community centers, does uh, health education seminars in the community, which are have culturally sensitive material. They have health, social, and fitness events, um, again, which are, are readily accessible to that population. And the success is, is uh, phenomenal, that our chronic disease management programs, we've able, been able to reduce um, amputations by 60%. We've been able to re reduce the progression of end-stage uh, renal disease significantly. We have fewer hospitalizations. Our focus is really on preventing complications before they happen. And we do that by engaging patients. So I mentioned about the staff uh, speaking the language. We also involve the family. So the, that's a very important part of the Latino culture. And we're aware of that. And the physicians and other practitioners and the staff are welcoming to family and we have uh, educational materials and resources that are available for the families. At the care centers are also um, other services. So we have behavioral health, uh, nutritionists, diabetic educators, um, who are all in case management, and they're all available to help care for patients, remove barriers, and engage as much as possible. The, um, and we also have uh, products that are focused on these chronic diseases. And I think that's a very important uh, aspect of uh, addressing um, inadequacies. Um, so the, our plans are focused on diabetes, and they have um, low co no co-pays for diabetic medica medicines and supplies, uh, diabetic education's included in that. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a very important way to uh, affect the community. Um, so what we do every day is connecting patients, connecting communities, treating chronic diseases, preventing complications before they happen. I think that's really one-on-one, uh, -on -one, comprehensive, holistic, face-to-face -face care between the patients, the community, and the providers. And that's how we can really uh, continue to uh, address these disparities. Thank you very much. Um, Roberto Valencia. Good morning. On behalf of Walgreens, I'd like to thank Congressman uh, Rees and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for leading this conversation on health care issues impacting the Latino community. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's panel. Uh, some, I've heard some great stuff so far, and it really get, gets me excited. Uh, for more than 100 years, if you don't know, Walgreens is over 100 years old, uh, we've been a cornerstone of health in the urban community. Our first store was in the south side of Chicago. And ever since then, now we've grown to 8,200 locations. Our core purpose to is to champion everyone's right to be happy and healthy. We fulfill that purpose in part by providing the most convenient access to healthcare services and trusted clinicians, providers in thousands of communities across the U.S. Walgreens and our team of pharmacists and nurse practitioners are located within three miles of 78% of the Latino community and 75% of the African American community. And that's by design. Additionally, half of our stores serve medically underserved populations who need greater access to affordable care. As we know, access, which is a word that's been used quite a bit today, or lack of it, remains a critical barrier contributing to health disparities, especially in medically underserved communities. Access challenges can impact health screening rates, vaccination rates, and utilization of other services that can help prevent or provide early detection of disease and a number of chronic conditions. For many people in underserved communities, Walgreens is the store on the corner where the pharmacist serves as a frontline healthcare provider. And some of us call it La Farmacia, and some of us call it La Walgreens. <laughs> Walgreens bridges the gap to care through the services we provide in our more than 8,200 locations and collaborative relationships with other healthcare providers to help manage and coordinate patient care. Pharmacists are a critical part of patients' care team and commonly provide medication therapy cons consultations, disease management support, and administer a wide range of immunizations, as Congressman Rees alluded earlier. In fact, Walgreens has become the largest retail provider of vaccinations in the U.S., in large part because of the convenience of our locations and our hours of operations, but also because we go out into the community. We're not waiting for the patients to come to us. To give you a sense of the importance of this type of community-based care in addressing health care disparities, our pharmacies see patients with diabetes on average 20 times a year, 
the same patient may see a doctor two to four times a year. Interaction with the pharmacist helps bridge that gap in care. Walgreens engages in a multi-prong approach to serve those in need and address healthcare disparities. First, we firmly believe in the value of community-based collaborations. Since 2007, Walgreens and the League of Latin American Citizens, LULAC, have been working together to find ways to address health issues, improve outcomes, and increase access to care. Most recently, as a sponsor of LULAC's Latinos Living Healthy program, Walgreens provided thousands of free flu shots to patients who would not be able to afford immunizations without this program. One example of the impact of this program comes from LA, where for the past three years, Walgreens has provided over 500 free flu shots in one day, each day during these fairs. Additionally, for the past five years, Walgreens has been a lead sponsor of National Council of La Raza to the Salute Pavilion annual convention. Each year, we provide free health screenings to the attendees of this fair, and on average, provide over 1,000 screenings during these uh, events. There's not a silver bullet to address the disparities in health that continue to exist, but instead there's a need for multiple variety initiatives working to address the issue and really get it all hands on deck, doctors, nurses, even pharmacists. Along those lines, we believe expanding the role of pharmacists in medically underserved areas as done under H.R. 592, introduced by Congressman G.K. Butterfield, helps address the issue of provider shortages for those services that fall within the pharmacist's current scope of practice in the states. Again, we thank Congressman Reese and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Health for the opportunity to contribute to the dialogue. Thank you very much. A round of applause for all the <laughs> panelists. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick off the Q&A. I hope you all have been thinking of some very insightful and, and, and questions. And uh, I, I will have to remind everybody that a question is usually brief and ends, ends with a question mark. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> um, let me ask the first question. Um, what is the most important factor? If you were to choose one, there's plenty of factors that, we, that we'll discuss, but if, if each of you were to choose one factor that contributes to health disparities among Latinos, what would it be? We'll just go down the, the panel. I would identify the physical inactivity and excess obesity rates contributing to uh, this increased rate of diabetes as the number one issue, one issue. Okay, do you think it's the most important issue? I would say so, yes. Okay. I would say one of the most important issues will be the cultural competence of our medical, medical care providers. So they have an enriching dialogue with our community members in their own language and taking in, into understanding their cultural values and why they make uh, certain decisions and why their behaviors are based on these cultural values. Okay. I'll say, uh, this is from the plan perspective, really navigating the healthcare system. That uh, it's very complicated for basically everybody and it's even more complicated when it's something that uh, is either new to you, you're a new, new to the healthcare space or health insurance space, or you also have uh, communication or other challenges that you have to face in addition to navigating the system and coordinating your own care. For us um, in the stores, our biggest challenge is the language barrier. And uh, you said there's, uh, I think you said 10% of doctors are uh, Latinos and the pharmacists, we struggle finding pharmacists that can speak Spanish. And um, we make that up with our pharmacy technicians. Uh, there are great stores and they live in the communities and they speak uh, the language and they can communicate. Uh, an example, I was in Denver a couple of weeks ago and I saw a lady looking, you can see she was struggling to find something and I s asked her in Spanish and her face lit up because she can communicate and she can really uh, get her issues resolved. She needed a cream for her burning feet. Right? And uh, that's the part, otherwise she'd continue to look and not find what she needed. So those are the things that, if we could get that language barrier reduced, it'd be great. Excellent. Uh, uh, Dr. Perez Table, I know you've spent your professional career researching these. Can you elaborate on some of the other factors that uh, contribute to disparities within Latinos and the other communities? Uh, absolutely. I, I, first, I think 
we suffer the same consequences from the standard behavioral and medical risk factors that any other population does. So, I mean, tobacco use, excess substance use, alcohol use, violence, all of these things affect our communities in a, in a big way. So not to say that there are unique or differences. Um, I think all three of the other, my colleagues here said issues that relate to access to healthcare. Um, so cultural competences, access, navigating the system, learn language barriers, all these are all absolutely critical issues close to my heart. And we are doing something about access <clears throat> on the national level with the Affordable Care Act. And in fact, in California, where it has been embraced fully, there has been the largest number of uh, Latinos who have gained uh, health insurance, uh, both by Medicaid expansion and, um, and through uh, private uh, insurance purchases. So I think this is a, a sort of a, a, a something that runs across the entire spectrum. And if you get access, then we start dealing with other with other aspects. Thank you. I uh, conducted research in the community to address the healthcare crisis that we had, and uh, I asked the community members, mothers, students, patients, the healthcare CEOs, stakeholders, etc. I held uh, six community forums and a summit at the end, and I asked three basic questions. What are the healthcare access barriers and prioritize them? What are some of the solutions, and how can we as a community implement these solutions? And the number one barrier to healthcare access in our community was costs. Not only cost of care, uh, we can't afford it, but also the stakeholders said that we don't have enough resources to make our programs sustainable. Um, Alejandro works at a healthcare district that is one example of a tool that local communities can utilize to help bring in sustainable resources and provide grants and others to low-income communities or to, or to deal with, with, uh, with care. The second most important um, healthcare access barriers were a lack of infrastructure. And what do we mean by infrastructure? I mean actual healthcare providers as well as clinics uh, and services that were available. Like I mentioned earlier, there was one full-time equivalent physician per 9,000 residents. The medically appropriate number was one to 2,000. Uh, to be considered medically underserved uh, federally is one to 3,500. So we don't have enough physicians in our underserved uh, communities. And this was MDs and you know DOs practicing primary care, any kind of physician. The numbers are even worse when we talk about mental health experts, mm -hmm. when we talk about dentists. I mean, that's a whole other uh, uh, healthcare provider shortage that, uh, that exists. The third, interesting enough, was cultural sensitivity, uh, what we call cultural humility, understanding the, how your own personal cultural views affect uh, the patient-doctor relationship and being able to address that not only personally but also with the healthcare system, speaking Spanish. Uh, it doesn't make sense for a healthcare provider to prescribe a therapeutic regimen that is nowhere within the u cultural universe of a patient. You are deeming that patient to fail and if you explain something in a language that the patient really truly doesn't understand, you might as well expect them not to follow your, your regimen. So that's one, and the other was lack of knowledge of the resources that was available, uh, and the term that we use is healthcare literacy, like how to access health insurance, how to access um, uh, resources. Uh, a lot of our patients, for example, don't know that they can qualify for free medicine under pharmaceutical programs throughout the, throughout the nation. And one of my uh, uh, two um, young Latinas from my Future Physician Leaders Program created a pharmacy um, uh, medis medical benefits uh, discount program book, uh, resource guide, and went around to all the community health clinics and presented their research finding so that we can tie our communities to the programs that exist. Others are transportation uh, issues, and um, so 
those are some of those issues. So having said that, what are the policy recommendations based on, so <coughs> number one, based on your number one um, healthcare access barrier, physical activity and obesity rates, cultural competence, healthcare literacy, and language barriers, what would be the solution? What is your policy recommendation? Well, I think we start with access, right? So universal access to healthcare is number one. And then if, uh, not only being having insurance, but having a place to go and having a, a, a clinician who, who you identify. I think this is critical. And all these other components fall off from that. Now, the second big one is having uh, a biomedical workforce and a clinical workforce that is more diverse. Um, we're not even 10% of practicing clinicians. It's like in single digits. And it hasn't changed a whole lot. Latinos are approaching 20% of the population. And that will include the issues of cultural sensitivity or humility, language access. Uh, it, is, it is an absolute essential. And, and the progress has been you know, very slow, gradual, but it needs, it needs to, the country needs to really pay attention to this. Thank you. Any other ideas? I think for, um, for cultural competency is to increase funding for uh, federally qualified health centers to provide more culturally competent um, education and preventative uh, care classes um, for low-income families, and also um, formalizing the community health worker model to provide like a professional track. Uh, we have great community members that, that are great leaders within the community, but when they seek employment at fellow qualified health centers, clinics, managed care providers, they get shut down because they don't have, you know, the educational background, um, um, the formal, the formal educational um, classes here in the United States. But you know, in their in their home country, they were professionals. They had other careers, but obviously, you know, you know, their unfortunately, their you know, their credentials did not translate or transfer um, here in the United States. So providing a, a track for them to to receive a certificate program to, to, to actually have them be part of the care team within managed care, I, th I think would yield really good results. Wonderful. You agree? I, you agree? <laughs> Very wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I wanted to talk a about a really important part of the system, and that's incentives. So ideally, the healthcare system is designed to prevent and address chronic diseases early in the course. So we, we avoid all the um, unnecessary hospitalizations and disease burden that happens. Um, and recently, CMS um, altered their incentives to actually not pay for some of the earlier stages of disease. So they're no longer reimbursing for uh, early chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease is uh, divided into five stages. Uh, stage four and stage five are the more advanced stages where a patient's either on dialysis or almost on dialysis. And uh, CMS actually eliminated reimbursement for stages one, two, and three, which are the earlier stages. So the, the system is no longer aligned with incentives and the actions um, in terms of preventing progression of chronic kidney disease. They also cut the uh, reimbursement for diabetic neuropathy, which is a very important um, uh, complication of diabetes, which needs to be addressed as well. So we've uh, focused on um, trying to um, encourage uh, CMS to align the incentives. And we've worked with a number of uh, community organizations, the National Kidney Foundation, American Kidney Fund, uh, Dialysis, Patient Citizens, Renal Support Network. We actually also had uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Linda Sanchez sent a letter to CMS earlier in the year talking about this very issue. Uh, and it was signed by 36 Democrats, including you. Uh, <laughs> so it's a very important thing to, to to create a system that has incentives and goals that are consistent throughout. Thank you. you know, we have uh, over 18,000 pharmacists, highly trained pharmacists, and uh, we're not using them to their full potential. And uh, you said shortage of uh, team members to help. Uh, I think we were to recognize them as providers in Medicare Part B and HR 592. Now you have more hands on deck that can help um, you know, and, and I grew up in, in Peru, and when you got sick, uh, you went to La Botica, you went to the pharmacy, not the doctor, couldn't afford a doctor. And I think that still prevails, and if they could do that today and 
uh, the pharmacists provide that screening, I think we can m push them towards the doctors because nobody's telling them where to go. Uh, and I think that's the part where we could help. Thank you. Uh, as a physician, a, a you know, personal experience, uh, many of our patients in underserved, resource-poor settings uh, qualify for the Medicaid program in California. It's Medi-Cal. Um, but if you don't incentivize physicians to accept patients who are in Medi-Cal, then you essentially have a functionally useless health insurance. Uh, in our Coachella Valley, we have very few specialists, for example, who see patients on Medi-Cal. So what happens is if a patient comes in and I see them with, let's say, uh, urinary obstruction, uh, they can't urinate, so I put a Foley uh, in their bladder and they have to follow up to see a urologist. Uh, if, they, if they're on Medi-Cal, they have to wait several weeks uh, or a month to get seen at the county clinic, which is almost a two hour drive away. And this is somebody who doesn't have the resources to do that. The longer you keep a catheter in the patient, you develop neurological deficits in the bladder, which can cause severe infections and other problems for that individual. So that's why the poor and those that are also on Medi-Cal sometimes find it very difficult uh, to get the care, even if they have health insurance. Um, so that's something that's, that's really uh, a factor. So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to questions. I know you were standing first and-, Sorry, and uh, sure. sure, my name's Lisa Cummins, president of Urban Strategies, and we work with Latino communities across the country, particularly grassroots organizations, and all of the challenges that you've talked about, we see them every day. <clears throat> and related to the policy and what Mr. Espinosa was saying, you know, there's been a huge investment in nurse home visiting uh, programs in the last five, six, seven years, um, and which is a brilliant idea, uh, except that you don't have um, individuals that are with the cultural humility and cultural understanding, the cultural insiders, um, who have the re requirements to be that home visitor. And so is, has there been any thought about um, modifying that to allow health promoters um, to be involved in those cases where there's a preventative, it's really preventative. It doesn't require, in my humble opinion, um, the, the additional uh, credentials, medical credentials. So to me, that seems like a, be a neat opportunity, doesn't cost anything. Anybody want to speak to that first? Uh, I'll make a comment. I'm, I'm not a policy making institute, but um, as a clinician, I will say that what the health system needs to do is to transition from um, visit based care, you know, fee for service. You come in, doctor bills and gets paid, to managing populations. And then if you manage a population, if I have 2,000 patients that are charged to me as an individual doctor, then we have a team that takes care of them. And those who need those home visits are the frail uh, elderly, for example, or someone who's just been through a severe illness, uh, trauma, or otherwise. Uh, then we have the resources to do that in some sort of system. And I think that's slowly what the U.S. healthcare system is beginning to get organized into, uh, maybe more in California than on this coast. But that's the way to address this. Uh, because right now, doctors will say, well, you know, who's going to pay for it? Um, if I hire someone to go do that, who, how do we get reimbursed? And there are very limited mechanisms to do that um, unless we reorganize how we provide care. The, the number one most effective way to provide the cultural competence is to hire people from that community who, rep, who know the community, who are from the community, uh, and have the experiences and speak the languages and the cultural experiences. So we need to hire Latinas and we need to hire Latinos and train them and put them in, in those communities where they're from. That's the, that's the most effective way of providing the cultural sensitivities that, that we need. Um, the other ways is to work within the societies. I was senior associate dean at UCR Medical School at, within medical schools, residency programs, and other healthcare provider societies to make it a requirement in their training to have some sense of cultural humility in the patient-doctor relationship. You get trained on the interview, you get trained in the understanding. So how do you work with somebody who doesn't speak your language, who has a different worldview or a different socioeconomic uh, uh, background than what you did? And I think that's something that has been very highly encouraged, um, but has not made it in the, 
law uh, realm, but I think that every situation is very unique. There's different communities, different populations um, that, uh, that have different experiences. Uh, we'll take the next question. Thank you. Um, so the Latino community, although we're- Name, name and oh, your background. Pepe Estrada, I'm from Washington and Lee University. I'm an undergraduate student. Welcome, Pepe. Thank you. Um, so the Latino community, although we do not have the access to computers at the same rate that the Anglo population does, we do have a, the highest rate of cell phone usage. So for me the medical community, medical literacy is a very important topic. How are you or how will you uh, implement this phenomenon uh, by using technology to increase medical literacy? Fascinating question. <laughs> Fascinating question. Anybody have um, <laughs> something to say about that? <laughs> well, I'll say we, we have several initiatives in, in, I guess, what you would broadly call telehealth that we're working on. So they can do on, for example, we'll be, be able to offer online uh, physician visits, online uh, nutritionist visits. Um, we're also working with exploring texting. So inter not just kind of one-way texting, but interactive texting. Um, and even the possibility of giving those members who don't have cell phones, we could give them cell phones. There's certain programs that would allow us to do that as well. So I think it's really important to think about outreach and engagement in multiple modalities, and, and definitely technology is part of that, and it's, it's a big part of um, an opportunity to do better. Thank you. Two quick comments. Um, language trumps literacy. So if you have monolingual Latinos, uh, the matter what their health literacy is, if you don't speak Spanish, that is the most important one. And number two, um, the electronic health record has created a mechanism by which this becomes now a, a frontline issue. There is the portals in which patients are writing, uh, sending messages to their doctors. If our, if our population doesn't access some way to get to the portal, they won't have that. And they may write in Spanish, so then we need Spanish-speaking uh, writing clinicians to respond, whether they be pharmacists, nurses, or, or, or physicians. Mm -hmm. so. um, one, of, one of the initiatives that we're working on at the Desert Healthcare District is we're creating an app that's called Coachella Valley um, HIP, Health in Play, where we're, we're partnering with local healthcare providers to provide them an online resource, just like uh, Congressman Reese. I uh, talked about earlier about that student who created that binder with all these resources for um, the pharmacy incentives. Uh, we're creating this, um, this application that's going to be, be used by our local healthcare providers to, to be able to access specialty services within the Coachella Valley. Um, and it's going to be in Spanish as well. So um, somebody who's going to a local community clinic, a small uh, local community clinic, and the physician is um, requiring them to see a specialist, the physician himself or herself will be able to go on to this, uh, to this website and this application to be able to seek those services and actually make an appointment for them. And also on, on the receiving end, um, you know, the, the referring organization, who, the organization receiving the referral will be also, will, be, will have the, the capabilities to track if that individual actually made an appointment, showed up to their appointment, if they didn't, they actually have their contact information so they could actually contact them. Opposed to a, um, the traditional way that we're doing referrals now in, in local community clinics, it's just here's a, here's a piece of paper, here's his number to call, make an appointment, and we'll see you in two months. So this is gonna actually reduce those barriers so actually it increase the likelihood that they're actually gonna receive the service and actually make, make the appointment. Pepe, we have a challenge with refilling prescriptions. So we have an app where you can scan your bottle and it gets refilled. The note I made is I need it in Spanish. You can go to uh, Apple to download it, but I think I'm gonna take that idea back so we can start working on something that can reach uh, the Spanish-speaking uh, population. Um, just quickly, I, you're hitting a topic that is in the cutting edge that we need to be on top of and in the front end be involved in. Uh, as you know, anybody who has an, uh, an iPhone and others, you start to see all these big apps that start monitoring your, your distance walked, your blood pressures, your heart rates, and, and they're trying to create a consortium with different healthcare plans to collect all this data to do research and give you feedback, et cetera. So most of the time when there's initiatives that happen like this, uh, Latinos, African-Americans, and those that live in poor resources have to play catch up 
at the back end and say, well, well, how come you didn't do it in Spanish? How come you didn't make it culturally sensitive and try to work within mm -hmm. those organizations to then tweak it to feed our needs? We need to be in the front end so that we develop those technologies mm -hmm. first that will reach the hardest to reach populations uh, first. And I think, uh, I think you're, you're hitting something that um, personally I'm very interested in as, as well. We'll go on to the next question. Hi, uh, my name is Carla Ochoa. I'm an intern for CHCI, and I'm a student at the University of New Mexico. So my question is kind of, um, I don't know if it's relating to the topic, but it is about healthcare. So on one end, we have the patients. I mean, we have the healthcare providers. On the other end, we have the patients. So uh, I have a friend who I was just talking to yesterday who is going through depression, mental health. And um, it's something that really hits home for me, and it's, it's important for us to figure out a way to find her the resources or anybody going through that, the resources they need to see a provider who does not have insurance and who cannot get Medicaid because apparently she makes too much. So I know that we're trying to figure out ways to you know, improve um, resources, get insurance, but how can we action on this now? Because a lot of Latinos are very prideful and they don't like to seek for help. And when they try and seek for help and the doors close on them, like my friend, they don't know what to do. So that was basically my question. What can we do or what can I do now to help her? Well. As a primary care physician, I would say that her, one option is for her to go see her doctor if she has one. I mean, if, and, and I think there are community clinics that will provide that support. Uh, our FQHC centers, community-based clinics, do actually often have more resources available than regular practices in that they'll have subsidized, supported mental health, um, uh, behavioral health uh, person on site. Um, and depression is a treatable disorder, treatable both with talk therapy and support um, and behavior change, as well as with medications. And everyone needs to be evaluated separately. That's why I, I say that any, any good primary care doctor will tell you that they, they know how to approach this, to, at least in the first step. There's always complications and in, in, in more sophisticated approaches. That would be my, my first recommendation for your friend. Anybody else? I, I would just agree with the federally qualified health care center. They often have sliding scale programs depending on your income, and uh, they accept all patients. Um, Alejandro, can you talk to us about El Sol's neighborhoods uh, programs dealing with mental health? Definitely. Um, what they do is they actually have a peer-to-peer -peer counseling. I think that's that's one of the first things that I um, that I think your friend should see is that peer-to-peer -peer counseling and just having somebody to talk to about that in conjunction with the medical with the medical services that he or she might uh, might be receiving. But you know, it's so, um, you know, what they do is they do that peer-to-peer -peer counseling. And I think, and it's folks that have dealt with depression, talking with folks that have, you know, they're currently suffering with depression. You know, um, men and women who have gone through domestic violence talking, you know, with folks that ha are currently, you know, struggling with domestic violence. So I think is that um, community lay workers, you know, that they're actually able to talk to somebody who can relate, that they can say, you know what, you were going through that, you have dealt with that. How did you do it? You know, how did you overcome that that issue? You know, and I think that's 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 very very key. You know, just having somebody to talk to, and somebody that you can relate to that actually has gone through that. Because if you haven't gone through depression in this case, then it's really hard to kind of have any feedback or kind of any any suggestions for that individual. But if you actually, you know, gone through that and overcame it, I think you will have more more of a, a really good conversation with that individual and be able to kind of guide them and connect them with services. Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, good afternoon. My name's uh, Camille Martin Proctor. I'm with the National Council on Disability. And my question is with regards to, I think everybody up here has spoken about collaboration. How are we breaking down those silos with regards to interaction and community engagement across federal and local government agencies? Well, I think that the example of uh, CHCI is an example of creating programs and internships for you to understand the, to become policy literate, right? The policy literacy to, to try to figure out the interplay between the different uh, societal factors um, and engagement in those 
com sectors are very important. And, and one of the issues that healthcare, um, the healthcare stakeholders have had is that we exist within our own silo. That uh, oftentimes there is not the the link and the understanding with how education plays into health, how uh, the safe uh, community development for with safe streets, enough parks, and urban planning contributes to our health. I mean, we understand it in theory, but we don't participate in the policy making process in, on those communities. So I think the the number one way is to develop to sit on committees from the local, state, and federal levels to be able to influence policymakers. Um, but just like as important uh, with the example of hiring somebody from that community to work in that community, we need people who understand to run for office in the city council, state, and federal levels, right? It's, it's the, you don't want, you know, at some point, your, one of your goals is to influence policymakers. Why don't you become a policymaker? <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Karina Quintanilla. I'm an academic advisor with Ramon University in Palm Desert. I'm also a student there working on a master's in public administration, and I'm attending with Hope Leadership Institute. I would like to thank you first and foremost for your time and also the work that you've done. I know that through your efforts we've been able to bring awareness to diabetes and heart disease as the major leading causes of Latino health. But I would like to challenge the fact that the stigma that we hold as Latinos on mental health, where there is no gray area, you're either sane or you are insane, without understanding all the spectrum that's in between. So my question to you is what can we do to bring that awareness given the fact that as early as elementary school there is a disproportionate level of disciplinary action that are attributed to behavior behavioral health issues that can be addressed through mental health and understanding that ultimately these children with behavioral health that are truly undiagnosed mental health become part of the school to prison pipeline? That's a very good question. Um, so uh, my, my perspective on this is that the Latino population in general is accepting of the mind-body uh, dichotomy and interaction. So it isn't like everything has to be a physical illness. Um, and patients, people, understand that the mind's a very powerful, the brain's a very powerful organ that will affect how you feel. Now, this is not universal, of course, and so I think pursuing it as a model that mental health are, are just, mental health are disorders that are part of the spectrum of what we see in human beings, and just like someone with diabetes or heart failure or arthritis or asthma, this is something that we manage and treat. Uh, some of them are severe, and some of them are, you know, peer, you know, have episodes, and some of them um, are recurrent or chronic. And I think my own experience is that this is generally accepted by the community. I think, I think it's a, it's an issue of education and explanation in a culturally sensitive way, with the proper language and the proper um, concrete terms. Uh, I mean, we can't explain to someone with a sixth grade education the same way you can to a college graduate. So, and I think that's where our, our interventions need to really also be adaptable uh, at the individual level, clinicians, nurses, et cetera, and at the, at the general level. So I'm optimistic on this, uh, but it is a struggle across the entire spectrum, you know, where people with chronic mental health illnesses are stigmatized, marginalized, and in fact, as you well know, make up a significant proportion of our homeless population because of this, as well as people get incarcerated uh, because of this. So I think this is a generic societal issue, perhaps more severe in our community, but I think it's something we, we have to address in, in a systematic way, so. Anybody else wanna speak to that? Yeah, yeah and I'd like, I like to add to that, um, you know, it also, you know, the the empowerment of the school districts, I think, for them also to understand the different mental health issues. You know, um, you know, I have a nephew who, who has you know mental health issues, and you know, the solution is he's suspended for the day. He had an episode, he's suspended for the day. You know, he's you know he has another episode, opposed to the school district being a little bit more proactive in regards to connecting him, you know, and my sister to appropriate to the appropriate services and doing a referral and doing a follow up, opposed to 
just saying, well, he had an episode today. Let's call the mom. He's suspended for the day, and that's how they deal with the issue. So I think, you know, also including, you know, the the empowerment of the school district and the teachers for them to also recognize these issues and uh, and also, you know, have the proper plan to deal with these issues. Thank you very much. I, you know, I just want to give a shout out to the people from my district, of course. So thank you <laughs> for being here, Karina. Uh, uh, for, for the Latinas that are out there and, and watching, um, please look into HOPE. Uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous organization that provides skills and training to be uh, literate in policy developing and to become a policy maker. Uh, I'm a big fan. Also, um, Elizabeth Romero is here who is, was a promotora at a very young age. Uh, the, from Planned Parenthood and is now working with Planned Parenthood and I can only speak volumes of, of uh, appreciation for Planned Parenthood because uh, I've worked with the promotoras in doing the healthcare outreach in the most difficult places to work and they provide health education, they provide connectivity with the healthcare system plus like neighbors, they provide the social support within their community that strengthens our community. So oftentimes, they are the backbones of our communities. Um, so next next question. Uh, I was gonna say good morning, buenos dias, but it's <laughs> buenas tardes. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I wanna, uh, first, my name is Guadalupe Pacheco, and uh, just put the, con I'm, I'm with the Pacheco Consulting Group, but I put my comments in the context that I used to work for the Office of Minority Health for a number of years. So I went through various directors, various administrations, various policies, initiatives, et cetera. But uh, uh, on a personal side, my mom is 87 years old, and I'm dealing with all the issues that you talked about, cultural competency, ha access to health care, Medicare, prescriptions, et cetera. And I'm, you know, I, she lives in California, I live in D.C., so I'm navigating it through here, through my sisters, et cetera. But what, I would just, this is a general comment, and, um, and you can respond however you want. But we spent like 90% on treatment, okay? Maybe 10% on prevention of, of, of health diseases, right? Health conditions. And then we have an economic con kind of a, a divide in this country, which is growing. Uh, so we don't address, let's say, economic kind of disparities. Uh, we're not going to address reducing health disparity because, for example, I live in the city, Ward 3, and if you go across the river, it's like day and night. Limited access to health care, proliferation of drugs, a lot of policing. <laughs> uh, folks are incarcerated left and right. Grocery stores don't provide good quality foods like in Whole Foods or other neighborhoods, right? So, you know, we can talk about cultural competency and access to health care, but if we don't address economic disparities, those disparities are going to continue to exist. We had healthy people 2010, 2020. We're talking about eliminating health disparities. It's not going to happen until we address those economic inequities. So, that's it. Thank you. Next question. My name is Cresta Archuleta, I'm with Hispanic Communications Network, and my question is, how do we get Latino communities to eat healthier? My dad has type 2 diabetes, I gave him a bowl of acai, he looked at me like it was a bowl of poison, <laughs> but from infancy to elderly communities, type 2 diabetes is very hard to manage, but where do we start with getting access to healthier food, healthier habits? Um, you know, my, my first response is to make healthier foods more affordable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible that uh, a family of four um, with a limited income uh, is able to feed, to eat off of uh, McDonald's uh, and not able to purchase the food. And in my personal experience living in Coachella uh, purchased the fruits and vegetables that they themselves pick out in the fields. So one is to make these the healthy foods more affordable, and two is to change our paradigm of neighborhoods 
so that when it comes time to urban development or rural development or housing development, to have our little marquetas with farmer's markets and fresh foods that are, are available. Um, and you know, then there's a whole other, there's many more methods of marketing and health education and whatnot to help change behavior. But that's, that's the ultimate uh, focus of the public health field is how do we change behavior and how do we change the infrastructures to provide a healthier environment so that people can make healthier choices. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on that? I think, you know, what um, one of the things that we did with our diabetes self-management um, classes that were taught by our promotores was that um, the promotor actually went into the household and looked at the, at the foods that they were already, already consuming and just making small changes to the day-to-day -day meals that they were already consuming because um, research, you know, shows that if you change, you know, the dietary plan of an individual completely from what they're currently eating, there's a, there's a high likelihood that they're not going to follow that plan because they're used to eating a certain way, they like their food a certain way. Um, so just making little minute changes to the current nutritional plan and having somebody teaching them or just preparing something for them and not letting them know that there were these changes were made. Um, one of the, the biggest hits that we had were string cheese enchiladas, you know, um, opposed to using the traditional cheeses that, that our community uses, they were making string cheese enchiladas and little did they know that they were healthy, a healthier cheese with, um, with whole grain tortillas as opposed to the traditional tortillas. And you know the red sauce hit the whole grain tortilla, and they, they loved them. So just little small changes like that, I think, would would have um, really good results. I think it's true that uh, physicians really often focus on treating disease, and not on wellness. And, and wellness is really very important. We recently started uh, a diabetes prevention program. So instead of just treating diabetics or early diabetes, we. we try to screen and identify pre-diabetics, and we have a comprehensive program around um, preventing diabetes from actually happening. So they have group sessions with nutritionists, and they can talk with their peers and people who have diabetes and um, really learn about um, good behaviors and how to, how to address things before um, they become more uh, severe. I will add, I mean, both of these components are critical. So individual behavior change and then physical environment, neighborhood change. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't walk to a place to buy healthy foods, you can't eat it, even if you could afford it. And it has to be affordable. That's really essential. And you walk in any store that sells a variety of stuff, it'll have all the junk stuff and the high caloric, dense caloric stuff front and center. So maybe one, uh, one research I, I heard in the Indian country was where they were rearranging the stuff in the store and putting the fried stuff in the back and then bringing the fruits and vegetables to the front. And that actually apparently was leading some people to, to change their, their buying habits. So. As part of my future physician uh, program, our students have to develop a community health project and they learn leadership skills, how to, how to bring community together, how to have a budget, and how to report the value of their project in a scientific poster board fashion. These are brilliant high school students that uh, when you raise their expectations, they reach your, their, your expectations. Um, and one of the, the students' project, it was a team of about seven, eight, uh, they went into a Latin American like store. Uh, it was the Car Cardenas Market, uh, so they have a lot of Mexican-American types of products, etc. And they set up a poster board on wise choices, uh, and they offered to walk with the consumer down the aisles and look at, teach them how to count calories and teach them the differences between the different products in a way that also uh, dealt with their pocketbooks and the, they measured the value for that, and not only did they save the consumer money, uh, but they also reduced, they counted the amount of calories, et cetera, but they reduced the consumption of the, the bad types of food. So there's different innovative ways that we can really address that, and I think with um, the addressing the mental health uh, component and the stigma, uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to talk about it within our communities and not be afraid of talking about 
uh, illnesses, mental health, and talk about it like we would diabetes. Uh, talk about clinical de depression like we would a fracture of the arm, that it is a chemical imbalance, uh, that there is medicine, like penicillin, is for an infection. There are medicine for de depression that really helps you regain that, that chemical <coughs> balance. Uh, and one of the things that I did as a physician was I went on Notivalle Univision. Uh, it's every Wednesday in Spanish, every Wednesday in Spanish, talking about uh, health issues that are important uh, to our communities so that they can hear it from a physician uh, and hear it every week so they can have that, that, that literacy. Um, with that last question, we conclude today's panel. I encourage each one of you to think about your community, think about what you can do with the tools you have to not only address these issues, but also improve the lives of those in underserved communities. We cannot sit on the sidelines. We cannot trail behind and be reactionary. We have to be uh, in the front of these innovative ideas and implement those to address our uh, problems um, because ultimately we are the solution. Uh, we must all work together as a community to bring to bear the tools our education and experiences has provided us. And I challenge you to take the conversations you've had here today back to your communities and your organizations, inspire your neighbors, your colleagues, and your families to be part of the solution. Uh, two big takeaways that I want to say. One is that technology is the cutting edge uh, for us to start looking into how do we reach the most difficult communities uh, and how do we use technology not only to provide the care but to provide the health education that our communities need. And two, uh, there was a recent um, article in the New England Journal of Medicine that talked about how we have made some gains in the area of health disparities amongst underserved communities, <laughs> but not enough, uh, and that we still lag behind. The numbers haven't changed that much. And one of the main issues and reasons is because we have not dealt with the social determinants of health. We have not dealt with the income inequalities that we see in our country. We have not dealt with the educational inequalities and opportunities in our countries. And all these factors determine how well we live, how long we live for the next generations. So as a physician, because I'm a doctor, because I care for my patients, those questions were front and center for me too. And that is exactly why I ran for Congress, so that I can deal with those inequalities in job opportunities, in educational opportunities, in, um, in uh, uh, community development infrastructure opportunities in order to better the health of my patients and the communities in which I serve. So I would like to thank CHCI for inviting me today to take part and uh, thank you to our panelists for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to lend us your valuable expertise and unique perspectives. And thank you all uh, who chose to attend and participate in this morning discussion today. And I hope that you take the values of both personal responsibilities and individual choices that is so critical in, in health and health of a community, but also the social responsibility that we have to develop the infrastructure to make sure we have the resources, the tools, and the opportunities to better serve our communities. Thank you very much.